Hi, Jay Rigdor here in San Francisco. Thinking about my old friend Harry Riedel, who is a freelance photographer. He is a shootist of the highest order. Your view of the world has no doubt been affected by one of Harry's images. He's worked for all the major publications, from Life Magazine, The Time, Newsweek, Saturday Evening Post, plus all the European and Asian publications as well. He is that uh, rare individual who has accomplished what he has dreamed of doing, which was to travel the world and uh, get paid doing it. And in the process, he has become what he has most respected, an artist. So I thought, what am I going to do, you know? And I took one more picture, and I thought, I have to pretend I'm still taking pictures, then he will hesitate to kill me. And so very slowly I moved aside, and the closer he came, the more he realized that I was really pointing that way, which I wasn't, but you know, I, I moved. And I could see him out of the corner, stopping, you know, unsure, you know, you know. And he turned around and he saw there was a double-decker bus going by, you know, and he thought, um, tourists, double-decker bus, you know, idiot, stupid idiot. And, you know, walked away and, and under his breath, you know, was uh, shouting obscenities. But um, so uh, this is typical because, you know, my, my camera has helped me out of a lot of places. And... Uh, <laughs> Got you into him, too. I think. Yeah, that's <laughs> very true, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we are at the uh, H.M.D. Young Museum, where the uh, show that originated at the Whitney finally wound up. And it's a beautifully arranged uh, show to give it the proper San Francisco taste. Uh, my photograph of 1957 of uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, having, uh, displaying all the banned books in America at the uh, trial of Howell, you know, the Howell book was stopped by the customs and they had to go to court and fight to get it out of there. And in the process, of course, we released, uh, or they released, uh, a whole bunch of books that had been uh, banished for many, many years. And so this was a, probably the most wonderful thing that happened during this time here. Uh, this was the City Lights bookstore on uh, Columbus Avenue. And uh, here you see the howl, and up there also is howl. You can see up there. And uh, Ferlinghetti, who is a uh, very sophisticated man, and uh, uh, in fact graduated from uh, um, the Sorbonne, uh, did this, and you know we have to be grateful to him for for all time because. Uh, this is interesting also. Here's uh, one of the early paintings of uh, Ferlinghetti. And um, it's a painting of a grim face and it's called Big Brother. You know, what more do you need to say? And uh, he really scored one against the Big Brother. One down and two to go, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so. When did you shoot this? What year? 1957. 57. At that time, the people were coming in. Ginsburg came in to finish his Howell poem, and when it was published, he gave the reading of the first complete Howell, the six gallery reading that is uh, famous, you know, justly famous. Um, uh, the Howell was not quite complete. The second part was not done. So he uh, revised it and did the second part perfectly, and then they printed it. And then this began this dilemma, which was horrible, you know? But it led to all good things, you know? Look at the incredible things that were at one point all banished. The naked and the dead took a while to get on the market, you know? Uh, the Well of Loneliness, these are all published books that had been at one point uh, uh, held back. The, usually, for instance, all the Miller books were printed in Paris, and you could not purchase it or borrow it from a library 
in, uh, in the 50s, until this trial. You know? Suddenly now you can buy Miller books, which is about bloody time, you know, if, to be honest, uh, I mean, he's one of the most important uh, writers of American history, uh, art history, and uh, you, nobody could buy the book. I found it in, uh, in Mexico City, nearly blew my head off, it was so fantastic. You know? So anyway, after the Howe publication, I walked with Allen Ginsberg through downtown San Francisco, and I said, you know, I was amazed at your references to Moloch, because I grew up with uh, Greek uh, and uh, Roman tales and all kinds of things in Central Europe, so I was very familiar with Moloch and scared of him, in fact, you know one of the bogeymen of my youth. So I said, so uh, anyway, where uh, is uh, some kind of symbol that means um, Moloch to you? So he looked around and uh, he saw a building that everyone claims is the Sir Francis Drake Hotel. I'm not too certain it could have been an insurance building or whatever. Um, but it, there seems to be a face on it. Let's go and take a look. See, here we are, and uh, I think he saw this and this and that, and it was the two eyes and the nose, you know, and, you know, and whatever he has on his head, some weird hat. Uh, anyway, uh, Alan, without thinking, turned around and said, uh, that's, that's Moloch, you know. And so uh, I asked him to do this again, and he pointed at Moloch. What I did was I... Uh, had a flash with me, thank God. I very rarely use it, but on this I had to. It was in the middle of the night. Uh, after my flash had gone off, he put down his arm, but I kept the lens open because I wanted the outline of the building to etch into the film, and especially the fire escape, which I like fire escapes. You know, there should, in every situation, should be one fire escape that you can get on and slide off. Anyway, uh, this is why the building seems to be etched over his arm. Because he put down the, the, the arm and the building, you know, had time to go in. And even here, you see the little lights? He must have stepped aside a few inches and the little lights got on the film. So it's not a fake, it just looks like one. Or let's say a dream is even better. All right, and then uh, another aspect of these times was uh, jazz and poetry. Uh, I have my own theory, but better listen to the people who are actually writing the history. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, Lawrence also became involved in poetry and jazz. And this is the Bruce Lippincott quartet he played with. They gave one performance, I believe, at the cellar or uh, one of the Grand Avenue uh, coffee houses. And um, it was very exciting. There are several recordings available on this, and uh, I suggest everybody to look into it. All right, and then uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, here we have, look, the uh, basement of uh, uh, Ferlinghetti City Lights Bookstore. Uh, and from the left, we have uh, Philip Lamantier, the poet. Uh, Jerome Rothenberg, who is a teacher at the University of California, uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti himself, and the only picture of Duncan with a beard that I've ever seen, you know, uh, he must have worn it on and off, but I never saw it. Uh, also, please look at this, it's very cute. On the back of the wall, it says, remember Lot's wife. And here it says, I am the door. And this is actually the door where they delivered books. So it's very, very nice. I just love that, you know, little thing. And here you can check out, you know, Lady Chatterley, love her, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, filthy books that suddenly were able to come out. You know? So it, it was a wonderful period, and it should be honored for that, you know, that it opened a gate for all the people to come. You know, you can now express yourself unless you're stupid. You very likely can print it. Even some stupid people can print things. <laughs> Slowly you get into the habit of seeing the world as an 8 by 10, you know, you go around like this. And it's always a, a vertical 8 by 10 because that way you have a chance of hitting the cover.
you know, if you're horizontal, it would have to be a pretty good picture to go over two pages, you know, very rare. So they put it half page. See? So, uh, uh, when I first uh, came to uh, San Francisco with the idea of uh, photographing artists, the first name that came to my mind was Henry Miller, because I had a feeling that the man owed me something. I had um, uh, been down to, uh, with, with my you know, very meager savings, had been down to Mexico the year before I took this picture. And um, on the way down, I got off the bus in San Francisco. I think I've told you that already. And uh, it struck me that I should spend the next break that I have in San Francisco, because uh, it was just too palpable, the excitement and uh, you know the, the, the creativity that was around. So I thought, you know, if even the cab driver sounds so great, you know, uh, how, how, what would it be like to listen to a writer or a poet? And uh, so the next year, I had a little money together, I went to San Francisco, and began to think of photographing artists. No, not any particular discipline, but anybody who came along. In uh, Mexico, I found the first volumes of Miller for sale. Uh, they were for sale, you know, through Olympia Press in, in Paris, but I never had any money in Paris, even to eat, so let alone to buy a book. And so in Mexico, I bought Tropic of Cancer and was immediately sucked into an incredible vortex of excitement. And so much so that I ignored a date I had with a beautiful girl. <laughs> and she was going to come around at six. I lived in her uncle's house as a tenant. And um, I was reading Tropic of Cancer. And uh, I, say, I hear the door opening downstairs. And I thought, oops, here's my date. I looked here, six o'clock. Uh, well, she can busy herself five minutes. She has to go to the bathroom or whatever, make up or whatever. So I'm going to read a little more Tropic, and then I go down and, and, and consummate whatever there is offered by the tray of life. And so uh, 10 after 6, she began to move around furniture, and you could hear all kinds of noises. Uh, obviously, she was trying to let me know that she was around. Uh, I said, well, it's just one more page, you know, and it's just getting so exciting, you know. And then I hear a slam, and she had slammed the front door, and she was gone out of my life forever. So when I came to San Francisco, I said, where does Henry Miller live? So they said, well, he lives uh, down in Big Sur. I said, great, because I'm going to, you know, demand some kind of restitution <laughs> for that. So I drove down to Big Sur. I found his mailbox right away. I uh, find the road that leads up to his house. I went up to the front door and knocked on the door. And Miller opened up and said, yes, uh, can I help you? I said, uh, Mr. Miller, um, you owe me a cup of coffee. He said, what? What are you talking about? I said, well, you know, I told him the story about the girl in Mexico. I said, and it's because of you and your book that I never, you know, enjoyed the sweetness of this lady. He said, come on in. So we had a coffee together. And then I said, actually, I want to take your picture. This is the real reason I came, and uh, if you don't mind. Oh, it's all right. So he posed, whatever. And I always try to give the um, subjects the choice uh, of where to go. Only if they say, well, I don't know, then I suggest places. So he was very nice because he moved around. He'd been in that situation before. And he sat at a table and had a cigarette. And I took a few pictures. And then uh, I took him outside. And we took a few pictures outside. And he said, oh, could you do me a big favor? Could you uh, take a few pictures of some of my drawings and uh, paintings? Because I need to send away some copies of these slides if you can make me some. I said, sure. But so I use another camera for that. So we went outside, and I lined up the uh, paintings and drawings along a row of bushes outside of his house, and uh, started to photograph them one by one. And I had brought out my work camera, the Rolleiflex, which was ideal for portraiture, because you don't ever have to have it in front of your face. 
So it's not threatening. It's not like a howitzer coming up to somebody, you know. All you do is look in the top, focus on the eyebrows, and the rest, uh, you know, you can chat and talk. And uh, as he gets more and more involved and, and, and less and less uh, uh, interested in the camera, you press the button and, you know, then he's completely oblivious of what's going on. And it's wonderful. So I had put the, the tripod with uh, Rolleiflex out there, was taking the picture of the paintings and the drawings, and all of a sudden I hear behind me Miller saying, Harry say cheese, you know. So I turn around and there he was, and uh, in a scary almost in a way because look how in command he is, you know. I mean he's totally part of the camera, and uh, any other person would have been a bit uh, awkward, or, you know, wouldn't know how to stand or what is perfect, you know. And uh, it, it was the memorable photograph that I always like because it's the least pretentious, there's no, you know, it's reality. This is Miller paying me back for what he did to me in Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Oh, the absolutely straightforward person, uh, which is uh, the most you can really ask from, a, from someone to share their true feelings with you at all times. I've never seen him do any motion or anything that was fake. It was all you know, this is me. You like me? Great. You don't like me? Well, we can't please them all. This is then where it more or less started. Uh, we happened to be in an Italian part of town, which is where I was very happy. Uh, the Italian part borders immediately upon Chinatown, which I also like a lot. And so I was never happier before, and come to think of it, or after. It was great to arrive here, and uh, everybody was full of beans and full of uh, things that needed to be said, and they all had various ways of saying it, and it was exactly what I had hoped for. That's what it was. And so I instantly was, was pulled in and started to take photographs of uh, painters, and I met Imogene Cunningham, the photographer, uh, almost instantly, she lived one street over on Green Street. I was on Vallejo, and you know, it was—it's sort of like a um, living half your life in coffee shops. And so the feeling was that you were among your peers. And uh, uh, I then instantly began to think of making this a whole body of work, not just a few shots of a few people. And so. Um, I began to collect names and to get involved and to listen to who was doing what and why and, uh, and how were they doing it, which was important. There had to be a, a tremendous amount of passion, otherwise, um, you know, it means nothing. If somebody is painting, that's well and good, but there has to be a blood in the paintings. There has, it's, uh, it doesn't work any other way, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to describe. But, um, uh, so from then on, it was just one flight through the magnificent skies of the Bay Area. It was the best time. Café Roma, wherever the Italians are involved, you're at least guaranteed excellent coffee, which is half the battle. Hey, how are you doing? How are you? And uh, we are now walking down Columbus Avenue. And uh, by a strange coincidence, Columbus was the one who discovered America. I discovered America walking down his avenue. So here we are at uh, City Lights. Kind of library where books are sold, he says. Um, there is a wonderful feeling of non-commercialism about this place, which is very nice. I mean, uh, needless to say, they all have to make a living and they all like money, we all do, but it ought not to be the, the main ingredient of everything. And so you could walk in there and you could take out a book and sit there and read for a couple of hours, nobody would bug you, you know? Thank you.
And for me in those days, it was the perfect place because I would uh, go in there, have a little chat with Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and little by little people came in. Everybody who was anybody came in. So I met them all. As I mentioned before, when I ran out of subjects, all I had to do was ask the people I had already photographed, well, who do you think is interesting in, uh, you know, in the city? And they would give me a list of names, and uh, seven, eight, nine names. And whenever a name appeared on two lists independently, I went to these people. Because, uh, you know, two twice is no longer an accident. Once could be an ex-lover, could be well, all kinds of reasons, could somebody owe them money or whatever. Two times, that's for real. And I was never disappointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is it. Uh, let me just go in and see if, uh, if uh, Pearly Getty is here. I don't think so, but... Hi. Hi. Is Lawrence Sin, do you know? I don't know. You have to call his phone number. Oh. Can I walk up there? Or? I guess they're not in. So let's go and see what's happening at Vesuvius. Right. Yeah, here, this is, this is what he looked like just before he went, which is a pity. Here he was as a young man, bearded, and when I photographed him, he was a, a baggage handler at Greyhound Bus, and he was not bearded, very attractive young man. Where are we here? Center. He was the natural center of things. <laughs> Great man. I don't know if you remember the uh, pictures I took here. Uh, here's the wall that said, you know, remember Lot's wife. And here's my favorite dog, come here. I am the door. Led to the uh, delivery ramp. Hello. So, and here's Vesuvius. Uh, oh my God! He, he wrote a poem for Allen Ginsberg, huh? Berlinghetti wrote a special poem, Ginsberg dying. Allen Ginsberg is dying. It's in all the papers. I vey. I suggest we cut all this off and keep a haiku. They make a sibilant sound, a sibylline sound. Allen, they whisper. Allen. What more do you need to say? I don't know how to explain, uh, but I guess you're beginning to realize that photography to me is everything, you know, and or maybe it is that way, maybe that I put everything that I am into photography. You know, I didn't leave anything out. I've made all the mistakes that I made as a non-photographer. Some things worked, some didn't, you know, and, uh, but uh, you learn uh, amazing things. The extraordinary thing about uh, San Francisco in, in those days, the 50s, the late 50s, was that um, creativity had become so standard that no one was really excited uh, unduly or shocked unduly or anything. And uh, so one reacted to uh, only extraordinary achievements. Uh, the whole day was somehow embroiled with creativity. I remember I lived up on Vallejo. I would get up, uh, you know, leisurely walk down, have a cappuccino somewhere, then walk into City Lights and down to the basement and hi, that was Ferlinghetti talking to Kenneth Patchen about a forthcoming book 
Uh, there was uh, Ginsburg checking out what's been coming out lately. Uh, uh, Gary Snyder would walk in, hello, you know, that everybody would go to Vesuvius for a midday drink. I would walk over and have uh, uh, a meal in one of the Italian uh, restaurants and uh, there would be some painters sitting together, you know, Mel Fowler and uh, then I would run into Benny Bufano. Benny Bufano, of course, was very cute because uh, he fasted every Wednesday. He ate, ate nothing all day. And uh, Wednesday is strange. I mean, I can see Saturday. It's kind of a Shabbos. But Wednesday, I never heard of that before. But he said, no, that's my regime. So when I ran into him on Wednesday in front of the Italian church, I would say, hey, Benny, let me take you to lunch. He said, how can you say that? You know that I fast on Wednesday. I said, oh, damn. Well, I try it anyway. Next time, it's your turn. <laughs> Isn't it great? And you walk away feeling ten times better than, right? You came in. It's extraordinary. I chose to spend my life observing, and not only people, but of course people is my main interest. And um, I don't think I've ever taken a picture where there wasn't a human being in somewhere, you know? Even when I do um, views uh, of landscapes, I generally wait until there's a human being somewhere, you know, milking a cow or whatever. Um, what was it somebody once said? Uh, People are more fun than anybody. <laughs> you know, that's the, <laughs> that's the way I feel. Well, how did so. you get into photography? Um, it was a very funny thing because I, uh, the first big excitement about America coming to the continent from Europe was Life magazine. Uh, it was a weekly occurrence. Each one of them was absolutely flawless and you know in its observation of what was happening. Uh, not only that, but uh, Life magazine also was fashioning and shaping uh, a minimum of three generations of Americans and how they reacted to the world, you know. Um, from then on, um, to an American, a uh, black and white photograph was a perfect substitute for a full color, three dimensional picture of the world. But anyway, life did that to us, you know, and, and I think to, uh, for our best, because we now have uh, four or five worlds we can live in very comfortably, you know. As you know, the uh, black and white photography is now becoming, again, extremely fashionable. And because I think we, our brains were prepared, you know, by life. So ev anyway, this was how uh, I started to realize that I was excited about pictures because I suddenly realized that I could remember entire issues of Life magazine in their entirety, from the lead photograph to the last picture, you know. I knew the sequence, I knew, you know. And so I thought, that's rather odd, because I don't remember poetry that well. I have to sit down and to internalize a poem until I can recite it in its full uh, length. You know, it takes quite a while. What was life? It just took leafing through it, you know, with great interest a couple of times. And uh, so I thought that must mean something. And then I fortunately ran into a photographer. I was working as a waiter at the time, and he was one of my customers. And so I looked at his pictures and we chatted a little bit. It became more and more interesting. And then he said he's going back to Germany to visit his family or whatever. And so I said, you know what, why don't you, I gave him $100. I said, why don't you bring me a Rolleiflex? And he did. And the rest is, as they say, you know, more problems. <laughs> <laughs> but I then started to take... Uh, Photographs, I had no concept of what I would do, you know, that in, in other words, there was no general theme and I was not good enough for ad hoc uh, 
snap shooting that would then be artistically valuable. It's not possible.